Did you get any corrections if you go through the usual uh, geodesy of doing an observation? Uh, we have to take either angles or azimuths and reduce them to a reference surface. And in this case, they would be brought up from below up to the surface. If we're using azimuths, then we have to take into account the convergence of the meridians. Uh, basically, that's why the drift was given to you as being east-west, because then you know that it's uh, two kilometers uh, along the latitude of a 63 degrees. So you can calculate the meridian convergence from the shaft to the end of the drift, and that works out to be about uh, two minutes and seven seconds. And because it's a relatively short distance, you can use the rigorous formula, which is a function of the eccentricity of the ellipsoid. And you, if you assume an ellipsoid, or if you use the uh, uh, simplified formula that Chernovsky presents, you get pretty well the same answer. So the major correction would be the uh, convergence for the convergence of the meridians. If we talk about the random uncertainty of the azimuth, that would be a combination of the transfer through the plumb lines from the surface to the drift level, and then the traversing either by included angles or by azimuths or a combination going along the traverse to get to the endpoint that's two kilometers away, remembering that you would have stations every 200 meters. Usually it's a lot more expensive to measure azimuths, but as you'll recall from the discussion in the, in the chapter, uh, sorry, in uh, Zhirnovsky's paper on the optimization of breakthrough error, that uh, you can get away with fewer azimuths that aren't quite as precise as the angle measurement and still have a, a fairly respectable propagation along the travers. The worst would be to leave only included angles along the traverse because then you suffer from the effects of lateral refraction as well as the very dramatic accumulation of lateral uncertainty. Um, the uh, first one I've got on the list. Uh, what do you feel is the appropriate preparation time for this exam for a candidate that has completed the prere prerequisite exams and has extensive experience in plane surveying? I believe it was during the first session that I mentioned, or maybe it was in the second one, I mentioned that at most university level efforts of this type of material, this would be equivalent to two term courses. And a typical course uh, would be 36 lectures, uh, so that's twice, so that's about uh, 75 lecture hours, so there's 75 hours worth of material. And we typically say that you should be spending two to three times that absorbing the material and figuring things out. So I'd say probably 120 hours of studying. And the suggestion is, as given in the uh, learning outcomes part of this, and that's why the sessions were organized as they were. We have clusters of topic areas. And the idea was that you would start off with the first topic area and go through the essential reference item that's listed. and. And I've tried to put them in a fairly logical order of digestion. Go through those, the material, and then try the study questions. Some of the study questions have been organized as being focusing on the essential reference material. So that means once you've gone through the material, you could try doing the study questions. And then once you've gone through all the material, you can start going through all through all the, the uh, all of the study questions. 
I would suggest that when you do it, you try to simulate an examination. And you'll notice at the end of most of the examinations, in fact, all of the examinations, there is a list of formula. So what you might do is when you're doing a study question, take maybe the most recent exam uh, and have those formula ready when you try to do the study question. Try to do it without referring to the reference material. So I think if you do about 120 hours worth of that, you should be fairly well prepared for the three-hour exam. Okay, next question. Uh, are we expected to know that the likely approach is plumb lines? On the exam, I would have used a gyro theodolite. Would we lose marks for this? If your explanation for the use of the gyro theodolite were, pro uh, were proper, You're referring back to question six from October 2009. Yeah. I expect they are. Now, if you, if you think of this process and how it actually occurs, <clears throat> you drive a shaft that then is the start of the drift. And the drift is starting off in a certain direction. Initially, you don't have the possibility for setting up a gyro because there's no sight yet, because the drift is still getting driven. And so usually they would use plumb lines to get some reasonable idea of the direction, and then off those, start to drive the drift. And it would only be after at least a 200 meter stint that it would make sense to use a gyro theodolite on its own. And so usually there would be traversing initially as the drift progresses. And then there would be a check once there's, say, two or three stations, there would be an additional check with the gyro theodolite. So it would be unusual to use the gyro theodolite entirely on its own. Uh, if you notice with the uh, diagram that I had up earlier with the superconducting super collider, this uh, Robinson, this, is a, this was a particular situation that probably wouldn't pertain as much to that type of a question where there's, it's really more of a mining uh, aspect. But even in this case, oops, sorry, when we look at the um, horizontal transfer, there was still angle measurements going from the total station to the targets, and then the, tar the total station would be brought ahead to the next target position. So there would be a, le um, a success of occupations as you go along the, the uh, the tunnel, and then there would be gyro azimuths done once there's several stations. So it would be unusual to have only a gyro theodolite on its own. The other thing to remember is that a gyro theodolite, if it's of a reasonable precision, meaning better than than five arc seconds, is about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it's expensive to have it not being used. So usually it wouldn't, unless it's an, an elaborate scheme like the super collider where at, at least initially money wasn't really a problem, uh, you wouldn't normally have a gyro theodolite of that precision readily available. The next level of, of availability is a gyro attachment, which is already uh, five or six times worse. It's usually 20 to 30 seconds. That's where one would fit on the top of the of the total station. 